Sweet. Okay, for those of you, real quick, for those of you that are tuning in for the very first time, my name is Patrick Allman. I run a digital marketing agency at allaboutfocus.com. Been doing that for 20 years and change. And I also run Stop Doing Nothing, which is where we do coaching on how to teach you, on teaching you how to live a more ambitious and a better and a bigger life. And I like to call the members of our community playmakers because these are people that don't just kind of sit around and talk about things, they get up and actually do things. So good morning to you, all of you playmakers out there. Um, two coffees in, all full of water. Top Gun trailer came out, so I'm in a pretty stoked mood today. Today, we're gonna be talking about the importance of talking more about um, you know selling the, selling the hole versus selling the drill. I think when all of us go into business uh, way too often, we um, we go into business based on a talent or a skill that we have. Whether you're a software developer or you're someone who's really good at accounting or financial planning or financial forecasting, you go into this, you, go, you start a business because you want to sell more of that thing that you are good at. Uh, we see this with web designer, with car mechanics, with, with all kinds of different tactical skill sets out there. And one of the things that you learn uh, when you reach a certain maturity level in your business is that that only gets you so far. When you are uh, when you are talking to people, let's say you're a car mechanic, okay, and you're talking to someone and uh, and you're, you're like, I, well, we can fix your car, we can work on transmissions, and, and we can replace your brakes, and we can rotate your tires, and we can do this, and we can do that. You know, you are really kind of no different than the mechanic that's a couple of miles, you know, down the road, if you will. Uh, they, they can do all the same things you can do. They can change oil, they can change tires, they can work on the transmission, they can you know, uh, replace the head gasket, that doesn't really make you any different than anybody else. And in this video, we're not going to be talking about differentiation, but once you, once you, one of the things you learn, I think, with the maturity of your business is, is as long as you keep talking about tactics, you don't really stand out. You don't really make somebody feel emotionally like, you know, they should, they should pick your business over over another business. Your business is just the same as everybody else's business. And so tactics and talking about tactics in your selling process and your marketing process really only get you so far. What you have to start doing, and we're gonna kind of run through a list here of, of things you should stop doing and start doing. What you have to start doing to basically sell your business better is kind of flip that mindset and start selling the hole and not the drill. So when we first go into business, we are all selling drills. This is just the default mode, unless you get really lucky. Man, the drill is the skill that we have. You know, we are, we are really good at programming or really good at replacing transmissions. And so we kind of have to flip that. So today I'm gonna to run through a list here uh, as, as you know, kind of the things we have to start talking about to sell that hole versus selling that drill. And if you would, by the way, uh, if you're watching live or recorded or on the podcast, either one, uh, drop us a comment as to where you're listening from, you know, what you do in the world, what you sell in the world, and how we can help you, how we can help you sell it better. I always like listening about where our, our listeners are all over the world and how we can help them do things better. So the first one we kind of touched on briefly right here in my list of notes, my show notes for you, is you have to really stop talking about tactics, the actual things you do, and flip it over to starting to talk to people about their feelings. When someone pulls uh, into your mechanic shop, let's say you're a mechanic, when someone pulls into your mechanic shop and there's some bizarre noise going on, they're coming in very concerned for a couple of reasons. They're coming in because it's their car, it's probably their livelihood, it gets them back and forth, you know, helps them support their kids, help them, helps them get them back and forth to their kids' activities. It, it's their lifeline to their job. For a lot of people, you know, that car, that car has to work in the morning. So when they bring their car in, uh, it's got this noise. There are several emotional concerns they have, and you have to address those. Another one may be the cost. You know, the, the dreaded, you know, all of us kind of dread pulling the car into the, uh, into the mechanic and all of a sudden the mechanic starts opening up things and they're like, oh, okay, we'll give you a call. And then from that moment on, we're kind of on pins and needles waiting for that call. And we all know it, that mechanic call. That, uh, you know, call a couple of hours later if you have an appointment. It's like, oh, you know, well, we've taken a look at it and uh, I got some, we've got some news for you. And that's one of the most stressful calls I've ever, I've ever received when it comes to cars because I just don't ever know what's wrong with it. Especially if a situation where your car comes in and it's in really bad shape, you're just basically waiting to hear, well, heck, is this car shot? 
Is it a $5 fix? Is it a, was it a loose wire that fixed everything? So there's like a whole range of emotions there. So when someone comes in, when someone brings their car into you and you're a mechanic, you have to realize that they're in an emotional state. So you have to address that. And my mechanic, for example, my local mechanic here in Christian Brothers in Oklahoma City is really good about this. And what you have to start doing is when you start, if you're the mechanic and you've called this person, you say, okay, we've got this list of things. Uh, you have to be very careful about making sure you address these from an emotional standpoint. You know what? Okay, we've got uh, we've got fifteen hundred dollars worth of fixes here. We can fix all these at once, no problem. I mean, or if it's a little bit of a challenge for you, or you're a little bit concerned about the repairs, uh, how long they're going to last, do you need them, things like that. You kind of have to address their emotions. You know, we can we can do this, we can fix this, and this will get you by a little bit. We'll get you back and forth to work for three months. Or we can invest the full amount and you can have a reliable mode of transportation for your kids, for your family, for your job. And you obviously people can only go so much with their pocketbooks, but you want to, as you're selling your products and services to people, you want to convince people that it's in their best interest to invest the right amount of money with you. And not in the interest of you just taking their money, but the fact that if you really want to get them the result that they really need, they probably going to need to invest with you the right amount. As we all know, in, in our products and services, people can invest some abysmal minimal amount. They can invest a larger amount or they can invest in the sweet spot area. And that's what we really want is you want people to invest in the sweet spot area because one, we really do fix them up their car, whatever their issue is. Uh, but two, there's just less stress. I mean, think about it. If, if someone came to you with a car and they said there was $1,500 worth of repairs and you only paid $500 of it, the mechanic's going to do their best. I mean, it's not, it's the best they can within $500. It's not the best job overall. It's the best within your budget. And so they're going to do the best and then you're going to drive away and the mechanic's going to say, no, number one, that something's still, something's still broken and it could break really badly here shortly and you'll be back. But also, too, stress-wise, if, if you if you're in life, if you will, for example, your car needs fifteen hundred dollars worth of repairs, and you spend a third of that, you're not getting the full solution, and so you're you're not solving your overall problem. So to me, there's still some tension there, and there's still some stress about there's more I need. There's more I need to feel complete. There's more I need to, to fix my car all the way. There's more I need to solve my problems, and so there's there's kind of some. It's almost like you're you know the tension and stress is there, but you've chosen not to solve it. So make sure when you're talking to somebody about your products or your services, that you're addressing them from an emotional standpoint, that you're addressing their emotional needs and their stress points and, and their things like that. If you're the mechanic and you're like, $1,500 and they're like, and they're kind of on the edge, like they have the money, but they're not really sure if they should invest it. You're like, you know what? This car is important. This car, this money will, will give you an, a, a, an ROI several times over and it will be reliable. It'll start when it's supposed to so you can get out in the rain, sleet and snow and get your kids to school and get to work. It'll start in the evening. The heater will work great, which will keep you nice and warm because nobody wants to be cold. Or on the opposite side of it, it's the summertime, you know, we're going to fix this car up so good, it's going to be cool. You're going to be able to breathe. You won't have breathing issues with it being too hot. You'll be comfortable. Your kids will be comfortable whether you're in the car for five minutes or five hours. So make sure when you start doing that, uh, addressing someone's problem or issue, you're addressing it from the emotional side as well as the practical side. Uh, pay attention to, um, you know, people's body language is what I meant. Uh, as you're talking to them in person, and this is one of the reasons it's so great to sell in person because, uh, or talk to someone in person before you actually pitch them something, is because you can see uh, how they react. And you can see when you mention certain things, um, how you have to alter the way you talk to them based on based on what they say. That's why, again, you can sell over text message, you can sell over Facebook Messenger, you can sell over email, but selling in person and closing in person and talking to someone about their needs and desires before you try to sell them or close them is the absolute best, best, best way to sell something. We can do otherwise with technology, like, like things like video chatting and Zoom, but in person's always, always the best way. So talk more about feelings, less about tactics. Um, uh, when someone's considering investing in coaching with you, or again, let's go back to the car analogy, analogy. oftentimes we um, are used to using words like costs and expenses and 
And how much is this? How much am I going to lose in this? And is my car a sinkhole of money, or is coaching a sinkhole of money? And this is again one of those things where you just have to pick the right, the different words, because the the same words can mean you know different words can mean the same thing, but psychologically they present themselves better. For example, uh, I I learned often early on in my consulting that I don't refer to things like expenses or costs or money pits or anything like that. These are in investments. Uh, getting back again to the car analogy, if, if somebody has to spend $1,500 to get a car fixed, they are investing in the fact that that car is going to last longer for them. It's going to give them more pleasure to drive. It's going to give them more reliability. So uh, yeah, on the books, you know, our accountant may call things expenses, but oftentimes they are investments. And also this, this affects the buyer psychologically because buyers are more willing or they are to invest they're more willing to invest in something than they are willing to uh, create a new expense, even though it's the exact same thing on the books. It's X minus Y equals Z, and Y is coming out. Whether Y is an investment or Y is an expense, you know, either way, it's, it still works out the same. However, when you use the word investment and when you speak of people investing with you, um, number one, it gives you a higher perceived value, uh, but also it 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 basically makes people feel better about writing over a writing over a check to you or giving you their 16 digit credit card number. So start using that word investment if you are and stop using the words such as costs or money pit or expenses or things like that. Uh, I know it may seem trivial. I know it may seem kind of splitting hairs, but it really makes a difference. People will love to invest. People hate to spend money. Or well, what's the other way that this is put? Oh, people love. People, people hate to be sold to, but they love to buy, even though the end result is the same, right? So less costs and expenses, more investments. And the last one I want to talk to you about, actually not the 100% last one, is the importance of um, not being ambiguous with your words. People, in my opinion, I think there are a, the vast majority of people like certainty, they like certainty when it comes to numbers. They like certainty when it comes to time frames. They like certainty once they know that you have a, a plan, you know, a 10-step plan to get them from point A to point H, if you will. And if you speak in ambiguous, ambiguous terms, if you're like, um, well, we're going to try and do this, or we, you know, we, we may do this. I'm not quite sure how it's going to work out, but doggone it, we're going to give it the old college try. Uh, you, you, you may make money on this. Your car may work when you're done. That is, that does not make people feel confident about working with you and about doing things with you and about investing in your service-based business. You have to start using words, in my opinion, that are more um, quantifiable, that are you know definite. Uh, this you know we guarantee this will last X number of months. Getting back again back to the car analogy, you you know you work with us for eight weeks and we are going to get you these results as long as you put in the work. That's how I like to speak to people when they hire us for coaching is you, you hire us for this long, you're going to get these results. And I, I guarantee it, but you have to put in the work. So start where, where you can, this one, because I'm, I'm, I don't know uh, what your particular business model is, my friend. This one may become a little bit of a challenge. So if you have any questions about how to do this, message me on Facebook or leave a comment on the YouTube video or on the Facebook video. And we can kind of work some, through some terminology there for you of the words you use. But my overall goal here is basically to stop speaking in ambiguous terms or, or kind of living in that gray area of where you, you kind of do this, you might kind of do that, or, or things like that, and speak more in terms of quantifiable numbers. And oh, the, oh, another great one here I like here in my notes is to stop uh, when you're talking about progress in things and in your business. And, and things that you do in worlds, stop talking. Um, if you want people to basically kind of believe in you more, stop talking about smaller things and start talking about bigger picture things. Uh, stop talking about 30 foot views or 300 foot views and start talking about 30,000 foot views. Uh, I like to stop talking about days and look more in terms of things that are like weeks and months. And I do this with financial analysis. I do this with web analytics. Is I like to summarize things by bigger numbers because 
small individual, you know, let's say hourly and daily things in our lives, they just, they, they, they come and go all the time. They're highs and lows, highs and lows. This may be going on today, this may be going on tomorrow, this may be, this may, but, but what's, what's cool is when you start doing things like averaging out things or building trends or looking at bigger numbers, you see bigger things happening. Uh, I may, you know, a client uh, may hire us for some, for some web marketing consulting. We may look at their numbers and, you know, individual on a day-to-day basis, sometimes things look like they're not working, like maybe their investment with us was a failure. However, once we kind of step back a little bit in the numbers and we look at things at a higher perspective, we're like, well, you know, actually we're hitting our goals. Day-to-day, it may not look like we're hitting our goals, but on a weekly level and a month level, yeah, we are hitting our goals. So... As we go into 2020, start thinking about how you can start looking at your data and the results you bring to people in your life, in your business, in, in the in the bigger perspective. And you know, one that we one an example I can very much give you that we've all dealt with is things like weighing ourselves, like fitness progress. If you weigh yourself every single day and you you write those numbers down, you're gonna you're gonna drive yourself crazy, man. You know, our weight changes depending on what the temperature is outside, what clothes we're wearing, what do we have for breakfast that day. I mean, that, that it's just not any, it doesn't to me make any sense to weigh yourself daily. Weigh yourself a week and trend those numbers over time to see what kind of progress you're making. And your progress may be a little bit of a zigzag up and down, but you're going to notice that if you're working really hard and have great nutrition, your numbers are trending up. And if you're not doing what you need to, your numbers are trending down, you know that you need to take a, a highly, highly corrective action. So try to look at numbers in the aggregate. Look at the bigger numbers. Don't look at the hourly and the daily numbers. Look at the weekly numbers or the quarterly numbers or the monthly numbers. I've got a timer on an app I use on my laptop and on my iPad on my phone where I put in uh, like quarterly reminders of things I want to pay attention to. You know, this is when this quarter ends. So I've got a countdown timer, for example, right now that's going to show exactly when the current quarter ends. We are December 16th, so we're looking more like 15 days. But if I was to pull this up on my phone, as a matter of fact, I could pull up my phone, you'd see that I like to keep track of... um, of the exact number of days, hours, minutes, and seconds, because that's when I know my next measurement point is. And I do that for the week also. I have a countdown timer reminding me to, you know, kind of press forward as I as I aim towards the end of a given week because that is an important measurement point for me. So again, look at things in summary or in averages or in aggregate. And you're going to see probably, first of all, you're not going to stress out as much about the details, but you're also going to see um, better progress and progress over time, which is what you really want. We don't want to lose a pound a day and a pound tomorrow. We want to lose, you know, 15 pounds in a couple of weeks uh, kind of thing. So please try to do that. So kind of as a quick recap here as what we talked about, the overall theme of this show was I want you to start selling the hole more and not the drill. People don't want to buy a drill. They want to buy a hole. That's the way it was taught to me several decades ago. So you need to focus more on selling the hole than you do selling the drill. Um, you have to stop talking about tactics and start talking more about feelings. Uh, Stop talking about expenses and costs and please flip the script on those and talk more about investments, whether it's going to be your investment with somebody versus your cost or someone investing in you versus, you know, uh, having an expense uh, with you or having a cost with you. Got to talk more in terms of investments that will emotionally make somebody feel better. Stop talking about ambiguity or ambiguous numbers. You want to start talking in specifics, quantifiable numbers. that are going to make people feel more confident about the results that you're going to give them. Uh, and also stop talking about days and hours and things like that. And start talking in bigger terms like weeks and months and quarters. Because overall, when we have big, giant dreams, wishes, and goals... What, what matters is the things that, you know, the quarterly things and the, the annual things and the five-year plans. That's why it's always important in business plan to look at your monthly goals and your six-month goals and your one-year goals. I don't know anyone who does a, a business plan that basically lays out a, a daily goal. We, we, there are things we want to knock off daily, but oftentimes when we're looking at income or things like that, we don't look at that from a daily perspective. There are very few times when, when that's a good idea. It's, it's possible, but it's just not a good idea to look at stuff on a daily perspective. So you want to be looking at things at you know more of the weekly and the monthly and the quarterly perspective. And again, as always, just like the theme of the show said, please focus more on selling the whole and not the drill. Nobody wants to buy a drill. 
Nobody, well, very some people do, I suppose, but nobody wants to walk into Home Depot and buy a drill. They just want to be back at the house and they just want the hole to appear. That's the kind of guy that I am. I just want the, the nail to be in the board. I don't want to go by the hammer. I want the hole to be in the yard. I don't want to go by the drill. It's so it's all really good analogy there. Um, by the way, I wanted to personally thank you for watching so far up into 2020. Uh, we've had a pretty good year producing videos, getting content out for you uh, publicly and privately. We're getting some good kudos, which I think is pretty cool because we're helping people and that's really what I'm out here to do. And so we're going to continue to do that as we press forward into tomorrow and the next week and 2020. Did I say 2020? I meant 2019. Thank you for watching in 2019 is what I really meant. Um, as always, if you're watching YouTube or uh, Facebook Live or recorded, this podcast is also available on iTunes. Uh, we're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher, we're on Alexa. So you can actually go to your Alexa and, and, and ask to listen to the Stop Doing Nothing show or the Stop Doing Nothing podcast and it will play right there on your Alexa. I was at a dinner party uh, this past Saturday night I did it at somebody else's house. It was really cool and they thought it was pretty cool also to be able to just say, oh, I want to hear Patrick uh, you know, play the Stop Doing Nothing show on Alexa. And also, if you're listening on the podcast or the Alexa, remember that the live show I'm doing right now is done via video. So we're streaming live and video right now from the Stop Doing Nothing World headquarters in Oklahoma City. So you can go there and watch the live show. And I would really encourage you to subscribe on YouTube. That's where we're trying to really grow our audience. And subscribe on Facebook so you get notified on all the time we're going to go live. Until tomorrow's show or a show later in this week, thank you always for watching. I love every single one of you viewers. I love every single one of the likes that we get. And let's make it a, make, let's make it a good day. We'll talk to you soon.